I've got long sling in my bag, big ring, small ring. Okay, so on a takedown, this would be my that would be my long my long saber. Okay, so if I were blocking this descend down, I would have my landing over the top, my climbing line through here. I could descend down on this and I could deinstall it from lower down just by, by giving that a pull. So it would be my long saber, really long saber on a, on a felling job. <coughs> what I could also do with it, um, can, I have, can I borrow two branches here quickly? Good branch. And um, you do a branch. Okay. So one thing I could do is let's say I'm working on a lime tree on the way up. Uh, my impression was, I had a look at the base of these two, it was top 15 years ago, the base is really not great, so these long leaders that are regrown, so actually I'm going to use this like this, okay? Now it's big ring, big ring, small ring, the line runs through here, and you can see what's happening as I'm moving backwards and forwards, that line is running through there, so the load is equalizing between the two anchor points, you see it's self-equalizing, double anchor point that I've got, sharing the load equally between those two anchor points, or I could run it like this, <coughs> and I bring it down here. I put them in there. Okay, what well, I've got here, big ring, big ring, small ring. Okay, not exactly the same as before with, as with the ring. What I've done now is I've got two backed up anchor points. Okay, this is not floating anymore between those two points, but if this one were to fail, uh, this one would hold, and vice versa. Okay. So, again, that's good. Uh, that's. Um, yeah, a sling that has multiple <coughs> functions and what we're going to do with it here is to establish a base anchor so for that hey Mark, did, did you have that made? no, the, you can get these yeah. Yeah, uh, multi anchor or something like that I can't remember all these all these, all these the stupid names that Michael Greg gives me <laughs> sorry, I didn't say that <laughs> well it's true, I can't remember them I can't keep track of it <coughs> proper name. Okay, so I've got a prosig on here with a loop with a ring on it. Again, it's another situation where I'm moving away from. I'm going to be ascending, and uh, I can't keep an eye on how everything is configured here. So I think that's a great place to use a ring. So now I can go and put a. Uh, yep. Stick a beaner on there. And cinch that up tight. Okay. And really, it's you can do exactly the same thing with your balsa wrap. Okay. I'm not saying use this for your balsa wrap, but I'm saying you know how it is with a balsa wrap. They're really easy to use. So I'm just going to stick a balsa wrap on the on the on the on the base of the tree. Put in a webbing sling. Put in a carabiner. And a balsa wrap on. I've got the loading line tight. The person up in the tree makes the cut. The bit starts to travel. And as soon as it starts traveling, there's slack on the line, port wrap flops down, bit carries on traveling, it's caught by the rigging systems, comes bombing up, knocks the tree, you know, there's not a lot of control there. And because it's hanging quite far down, basically, this two times half a meter, it's a meter free fall already. Where if I've got the wraps wrong, that's going to generate quite a high peak force. So the same, this discussion could also apply to rigging a port wrap. <laughs> It's good to cinch, you could do the same thing with a long sling with a prusik on it and a, and a ring to cinch up the porter wrap really tight. You could girth the porter wrap on there. There's no connector that can cross load and the amount of travel you've got there is minimal, it's 40 centimeters. Okay? Anyway, it's not what we're talking about here, is it? Um, so I've got a base anchor, it's tight. Okay, the risk of this cross loading is pretty limited now. So I'm going to use, you could use a figure eight on there, you could use an HMS carabiner. To rig it, to put a munter, have a run a munter off it, anything like that. I'm going to use a rig for this. So, get that on there. Pinch that up tight. And then, I'll drop that down like so. Now, the other thing that's interesting is, well, let me finish this so I can properly. Tidy that up, right, catching. Now, so 
look complicated? Well, it's not really. I mean, what you can do now is if anything were to go wrong, uh, a, a trained ground person can release those wraps and can now lower this from the ground. Okay? If you, if you are using a figure of eight or a mud cut, I would suggest to put a prosthetic over the top or put you know, one of those mini port wraps. But anything where if you release it, it's going to run, just have another prosthetic rigged over the top. Then it would be um, figure of eight, release the prosthetic, and you know, bring the person down like that. Um, if you're using a mechanical device, a Grigory, for instance, the new uh, product experience documentation from Petzl on Grigories is a Grigory can only be used on a person not on an anchor, okay? It can't be used on structure. A Grigory can only be used with dynamic rope. The rig or the ID can be used with semi-static. That's why it's, this is not the case, but in the setup that I run, this top rope is semi-static. So up the front, I have fully static Dyneema, where I don't want any elongation. Running down the back, I have semi-static line so that this interface um, between this device and the rope is correct. And I don't think that's being, for lack of, the better, for, of a better term, anal about it. It's just um, ensuring correct compatibility and configuration between the elements that you... That you basically what we're doing is we're assembling systems. Okay? Just think about the way, read, read the manual, okay? and just make sure that, that, that it all functions together properly. Because otherwise, um, you could go the whole way and say, well, every component in the system is certified, but actually, they're not compatible. You know, so individually, they're great. They don't work together well. So that's maybe an interesting one to, to think about. So, first step is... Coming through. Knee in a few times, you know. And I'll get myself as high up as I can. Basically, what I want to do I want to get myself literally as high as I can up to the two foot lock down here. Okay. So, the next step is I want to stop an opt in there to stop that from slipping. Two foot lock down here. Like, so, okay. Now, next step is I want to have every, everything still secured. We're not changing anything there. I'm going to get a anchor point in above Tom. I'm just going to use a pulley on the sling. It's really simple. The cover was sheer on the rope in that situation. Tied left to set that. Then I'm going to. Sorry, I know it's rude to have my back to you. I'm going to store my climbing line through the pulley. Now, what I'm going to do is instead of installing the end of my climbing line to myself, I'm going to install the end of my climbing line onto Tom's main attachment point. Okay? So, this is a normal place here, through the pulley, down to Tom. Now, I'm going to cinch that up here as far as I can. And then that shortening here needs to come out. Mm. Where I shorten up my foot lock lanyard. Mm. Now basically I've got Tom in a counterbalance and I could just grab him here and just pull him up to me. Oh. Okay. Now <coughs> He's still attached, so basically I've secured, I've secured myself the anchor point stop and knots. We're still, both still secured by our foot lock lanyard. So next step now is to create a load bearing connection from his main attachment to my main attachment. Okay. And um, again, put it to transfer, figure eight goes in. And only when I've done all of that, yeah. I start to remove one foot long lanyard and 
super put on your head. And then I'll, re I'll recheck everything. That low bearing connection is really important in that, okay? If you don't have a low bearing connection, that's because you can see what was happening there was actually towing in behind me, but you do, do want to have that connection because you're counterbalancing, you want to limit the amount of travel between yourself and the engine climber. Uh, that is a really step for step thing. I, as I'm doing that, I'm, I'm saying to myself, okay, anchor point, low bearing connection, shorten that up, lift him up, uh, figure of eight, take that out, take this out, and you're good to go. Now in that situation, if you want to start cutting things, that there's a risk there, that because you know, there's, there's a lot of rope in there, some of it I want to cut, some of it I don't want to cut, that's going to be quite difficult. It's complex, yeah it is complex, I'm basically, the baseline is, is my climbing system, I'm using it the same as always, the only difference is, the climbing system goes on the engine climber. Now there's two routes you can go here, you can go, yeah do you know what, we can do that, we can, the guys in the team, free switched on, we're just going to train access unrescued, or you go actually, you know what, I think we'll go with this, go with a lowerable system, train the guys to operate a, a rig or an ID or whatever, and we'll just, we'll, we'll go with lowerable systems. They're both viable way, viable options, um, and I guess it's just part of a discussion, how do you assess that situation? Okay. What you're doing here, all these things that we've done now, mechanical advantage, um, this that long haul lift, there's, there's all applications in everyday work for that as well. So that competence that you're creating in responding to unforeseen events is also applicable in everyday production work. It makes you more productive climber as well. So there's a rationale there um, not, that goes beyond just uh, contingency planning. Or